What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? I have to say that it's probably one of the most iconic, well-known films. One of the films that a lot of people would say was their favorite, and that was The Wizard of Oz. Growing up in Chicago, I was always aware of television, going to movie theaters, because my dad loved to do this. He knew that I would be entertained by whatever it was that was on the tube or on the screen in the theater. And he knew that my being deaf didn't really matter, didn't fit into the equation. And I guess that he saw that I was, as a child, very outspoken, very strong-willed, very independent, very creative, and a people person. And using that, he knew that in me, I had a, a, a drive, a drive to set my sight on things that I wanted to do, that I wanted to feel, that I wanted to taste. So having known all that, he introduced me to The Wizard of Oz because he knew I would be mesmerized about the story of a little girl who began life very normally, just as I cherished my family life, but then who suddenly, I mean, here we're talking about my life and Dorothy's life. And then suddenly, well, I mean, you know, the tornado hit her, whatever, and knocked her out. And her world became a dream. And in that dream, I found myself fascinated by the excitement of what she was dreaming about what it was she was able to see, who she encountered along the way, what it was she was doing, what her, I mean, where she wanted to go, what even she was talking about, what she was singing, all of that was the package that I, I mean, she even had a little dog and the shoes and the outfit. It was such a, a big deal. And I remember this very point while I watched it, there were no captions. Imagine every time I watched the film before the captions came on the screen, I always created my own dialogue. What they were saying, what they were singing. And I literally had no idea what the film was truly saying. I had no idea that there was a background to Dorothy's life. And I had no idea that she was in a fantasy world, so to speak. I think dad purposely let me use my imagination as an actor would when developing a character. And so I think that's where I got my, my start as an actor from that film because I was so... I was so entranced by the film, the film first in black and white, the film then in color, the, the, you know, the munchkins, the witch, the good witch, the bad witch, the scarecrow, everything visually. And then at the end, she's back home. It, 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 I mean, so when, when, when I saw that, Every time, I mean, it would it would show annually on television. My dad always had the TV guide list. And he would always remember those TV guides. Remember the newspapers we used to have where you would look up the, what was on TV. That I'm that old, okay? I I remember TV guides, and he would go, "Look, here it is. It's Sunday night at eight o'clock or whatever it was." And I would always make sure that I would watch The Wizard of Oz without fail. It was the first play that I ever did at eight years old. I guess because, I mean, they were looking for an eight-year-old to play this role, to play the role of Dorothy. And I was the one who took that ambition when I saw they were putting together a production. I said, hey, I know that movie. I want to be Dorothy. 
regardless of whether I didn't know what the real story was or even the lines itself. But the imagination that was on display on the screen really captivated me, helped me open up myself and to create what could be. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? You know, in all honesty, growing up, probably not the story or the um, or the show, but really specifically, I have to say, was when I watched Happy Days. And I liked watching Happy Days just simply because, I mean, even before captions, I watched it and one night, it just so happened, my life changed overnight because there was an actress named Linda Bowe, who was deaf, who appeared on the show. And I saw this deaf woman signing in my language. And that validated, excuse me, that validated for me, whoa, I, I mean, she's on TV. I want the same thing. So I think that that was probably the first, that was the turning point for me. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? I truly, truly was fortunate to have found a mentor, a person who said I could do this, who said I did belong in Hollywood. Of course, there were my parents, there were my teachers, there were my mentors, other mentors. But the person that really struck it home for me was Henry Winkler when I was 12 years old. And we became friends. When I would write, he would write back all throughout. And he was the one who said, I could do whatever I wanted to do despite what people said. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And he, I mean, I always kept that in the back of my mind, his words of inspiration. He is a huge part of my journey up to the point when I won the Oscar. And when I won the Oscar, there were comments to the effect that, particularly by critics, one said that my win was the result of a pity vote and I was a deaf actor in a deaf role, so how is that considered acting, even the best acting? And I realized, okay, I need to approach Henry this time in person and I need that reinforcement from him to say to me to not give up, to shoulder on, because I was so new to Hollywood. I was so, so naive. So who better to talk to than Henry? Well, it happened that I flew from New York to California and we had planned to have a dinner at his house, with, at Stacy and Henry Winkler's house. When he opened the door, I rang the bell. I, all I could do was hold out my Oscar. I was so shy. I just held up my Oscar like this, <laughs> sort of to show off. And they had the biggest smiles. They were so very proud. They couldn't have been more proud. And then I saw Henry's expression change and I knew that he knew why I was there. They, they sort of brought it down to a real level. And Henry said, you know what, Marley? You did listen to my advice. You persevered. You didn't give up. But I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. And I know that you're feeling a little out of sorts because of what a certain group of people said about you. Why don't you stay for the weekend and we can think it over? And I thought, well, gosh, okay, fine. Why not? I mean, hmm? And two years later, Stacy Winkler was telling me to clean my room because I was the person who never left. I was the guest who never left. But in those two years, while I was at the Winkler home with Henry and his family, I found myself in the most unbelievable time of my life where I got so much validation, so much advice, so, much, so many opportunities to discuss, to define, 
to listen to his experiences and then see them through my experiences, telling me that this is bigger than I could ever realize, but it was up to me to decide my fate, to take action if I want to keep going in Hollywood. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? Children of a Lesser God was a film that people found, I mean, they fell, they fell completely for the film in that there was a deaf woman using sign language. There was a love story between a deaf and hearing person. And the film operated on so many levels. And over the years, in 35 years in this business, I've learned a great deal having, I mean, there are, there were so many positives, but at the same time, there were a lot of barriers. And what I learned from Henry was either to knock down barriers, walk around barriers, or take the opportunity to discuss with people what those barriers are all about. And as far as barriers came my way, if they were scripts, if I found something that wasn't written for a deaf person, I would turn that into a positive and have them accommodate me. And most times it worked. Not all the time, but it worked. And I respect a filmmaker's vision. If it works, fine, they can use me. For me to be in it, that's great. If it doesn't, that's fine, I'll move on. But there's one egregious example that really knocked me for a loop. And I got a real taste of, how can I say it? Um, not a barrier and it's not necessarily discrimination if you want to call it that it, it, it was so many things at once and it was when i got an offer to play a courtroom judge and i was so excited because i don't think i've ever seen on television in the history of television a culturally deaf actor playing a judge in a courtroom who was culturally deaf there has never been this we've seen judges in real life who have progressive hearing losses in real life but we've not seen that on television so i thought well this is exciting on a four episode arc i did my research i called two or three judges friends of mine to see how this might work maybe perhaps if i could visit their courtroom and so then when i realized oh wait a minute okay the script wasn't written for me but they're asking me to play the judge i need to sort of clue them in as to the set, and in this particular set, I would need an interpreter in the courtroom. Obviously, it's a no-brainer. I mean, maybe one or two interpreters. I've had interpreters on other shows as roles, and the producer didn't get it, and after the offer was made and I explained it to him, he took it back. He wasn't willing to make the accommodation, and I tried to explain it as nicely as I could, as how it could work, how it's worked in other shows, how it wouldn't change the emotional arc of the show, in fact, would make it more interesting. And it was a no-go. And that, to me, was a barrier that I just thought could happen to anybody, to any actor who happens to be deaf out there. What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? It's clear that streaming has a great deal of potential for access, 100% access because of the availability of subtitling. In fact, all streaming services are subtitled, closed captioned. Whereas in theaters, some theaters provide captioning through tools that we depend on, whether they're caption glasses or rear window caption devices, which are a bit of a struggle, they're a pain in the ass. But at least it's something, it's something. But in terms of streaming, I mean, listen, in theaters, we've always asked for open captions. You know, go to the theater, get your popcorn, get your candy, sit with your friends, sit with your family, and sit there and watch without having to depend on a tool and watch it equally through open subtitles. And I'm proud that as a result of Apple, they created theatrical showings of CODA with open captions. It's the first time a studio in the history of the film business has provided open captions for film in American Sign Language, and I hope that they will follow suit. Others will follow suit. You know, it's, it's, you could, you could do it in theaters, 
And most theaters have the capacity. I mean, what do they have? These multiplexes, six, 12, 14 different theaters in their complexes. So why couldn't you take two or three theaters and have open captions? It's not only for the deaf, people who want to learn to read, people who want to learn English as a second language. It, it's accessibility for all. And streaming does that, theaters don't that. Streaming provides the ultimate accessibility. It really does, they really do. It really, it really, really struck me as how important that is for everybody. And you know what? We know we have to pay for streaming services, but Apple TV is only $4.99, so that's a pretty good deal. It's a good deal. <laughs>